Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is arterial and parkways uh, for arterial and parkway streets. Street lights on arterial streets shall be LED, minimum 16,000 lumens with cutoff luminaires, luminaire elevation of 32 feet mounted on a marble light pole with a 12 foot aluminum mast arm. A minimum of two uh, street lights shall be installed at each intersection. Street light spacing shall be 260 feet minimum to 300 feet maximum. Street lights shall be installed on both sides of the street. If an intersection is signalized, a street light shall be installed on each corner as part of the traffic signal system. A minimum separation of 20 feet is required between trees and light poles. And uh, what you see here is our typical uh, street light pole, which um, shows the, uh, the distance that it is either from, in a, uh, from the face of curb. Uh, it shows the, uh, uh, cur uh, recently we added uh, foundation or footings to our street poles for years, many years, our, our poles were just direct buried. So I would say probably two years ago, we adopted this uh, standard and so moving forward, everything now uh, will have a, a footing um, to hold the, the pole up, upright. Um, this this uh, standard here has, you know, a lot of information on it. You know, it talks about, you know, um, again, it has a chart there that shows, you know, if the, if the, uh, the road is classified a, a collector arterial, it tells you what the mounting height is, it tells you what the mast arm length is, uh, and then just has uh, typical notes. Um, pertaining to electrical requirements, um, talks about the, uh, you know, the, how to do a splice, um, where to place the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, junction box for the uh, point of service from the pg and &E box. Um, but this is, this is pretty much a common standard for, for any pole, whether it's a local collector or arterial. Uh, any questions on streetlights? No, this is Frank. This is Frank. I, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, thanks, uh, okay. Frank. I appreciate that um, that presentation. Oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, have you guys? Uh, uh, let's just stay on the streetlights right now. Have you um, considered um, uh, solar poles? For street uh -huh. I, I think our, our city engineer just, uh, we, we talked about a couple of days ago. And so um, I'll let Jeff kind of speak on that a little bit on, on what he what he researched, uh, you know, in the short period of time regarding uh, solar streetlights. Well, I mean, I, I don't need an answer tonight. I just, is it, so if you got something ongoing and you want to bring something back, pretty confident, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, we, um, well, we talked to a developer and uh, they had mentioned that they had uh, installed them as part of their project, but um, and Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it might have been just maybe in, in, a, in a park or maybe in a, in a trail, but I believe Jeff couldn't really find a, a city around here that had, um, you no, know. You gotta go outside. You got to go to Arizona. You got to go to Nevada. Oh, Arizona. Places like oh. that. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we, uh, Dr. Gunner, we are, we are looking into that. Um, and so we will bring that back to you as soon as we, um, we're able to get more information and, and, um, you know, find out costs, maybe some, if someone's had them in, in the ground for, you know, a good period of time, find out what kind of problems they had possibly sure. with them, um, that kind of stuff. So um, we'll bring that back uh, when we have more information. Yeah, and how they finance them too, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, the, other, the other thing I want to do, uh, 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 ask about, it. have we done a survey, has the engineer done a survey, anybody done a survey of where we have poor lighting in the city? And do we have a plan to address that? Uh, I'm not aware of a study that we have um, have uh, have done. Uh, are, you, are you aware of some areas where we have poor lighting? Uh, we have. Well, I have not been. Well, I've been contacted of, of one location like uh, that I'm aware of, like on Cedar and and um, right. And, uh, we're we're getting pretty close to, to install a traffic signal there. So kind of if we install a street light, you know, we might be removing it maybe in the next year, year or so, but. Um, Why are we that, pretty close? Yeah, that, that might be a, a place that we might uh, install a street light depending um, if our traffic 
count numbers are still not where they need to be, then if it, you know if we think it's going to be a couple of years away, then maybe we look at maybe installing a street light at that particular intersection. But that's the only one that I'm aware of that we have maybe a you know a dark spot for some reason in that area. There are missing street lights, so I'm not sure what the the story. Yeah, behind I, mean, that. I don't know who what happened 30 yeah. 40 years ago, but uh, somebody yeah. agree with something. Um, well. My, my concern is that, that uh, Cedar and Silverado there, uh, uh, that intersection has a light. Uh, since we put the overpass in and now we have access to 41 there, that's a, that's a, that's traveled a, a great deal. And I, I have seen automobiles go through that stop sign on Cedar uh, and not be aware of it because it has been dark. Hmm. Okay. And uh, particularly when, if the on the weekends, if the city doesn't have any lights on, or if the school doesn't have their parking lights on, um, I've seen cars go right through there. Maybe they've done it on purpose. Maybe they've done an accident. I don't know, but that's a, that's a dark area. And then all that uh, cedar. The other area that um, uh, Bush Street. If you look at Bush Street from 18th all the way to 41, we do not have a lot of street lights on Bush. I think I've counted like four or five. On that. Yeah, maybe just on the probably on the residential Texas. side, but none on the uh, on the south side. Um, right. As like development does occur, like um, I believe when the um, the um, uh, there's that medical facility. I think when they they developed, I think the city required them to put in a street light. Uh, so usually when development occurs, we um, we piggyback a, a street light with the, with that project, but. Um, but yeah, those are areas that we can definitely definitely um, uh, look at um, moving forward. Um, uh, we're going to be doing a, a street overlay project, but we're not we, we're, we're not doing any type of um, you know street light installation because nor those normally take getting involved with with uh, PG&E, having them actually um, uh, do a Rule 16 uh, plan, which which um, which gives us direction on where the power is coming from. I understand that. Yeah. yeah so, my so is, uh, you know, is we, we should have a plan moving forward to address them, whether it's with solar or with PG&E. And right. when we want to talk about going out for a tax increase, those are the kind of things I want to tag on a tax increase. In my own opinion, mm -hmm. I, I would rather talk to my constituents and say, well, this is what the improvements are going to be. You know, we're going to put a street light here or a traffic light here, a traffic signal, we're going to increase the light age on, on Cedar. We're going to make uh, Bush Street a little bit more accessible. There's going to be a sidewalk here. I mean, those are the kinds of things that I think voters, if they know it's going to happen and we roll out a plan, I, I think voters by and large will be in favor because it's going to improve our city. You know? mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the other thing, I, uh, one more question I wanted to ask, and that was uh, about uh, Iona. Uh, from the golf course to uh, 19th, um, you know, that's a collector street now. You put another housing development back there. Um, actually, two, one south of the golf course and one uh, a little bit uh, west and, and, uh, of the golf course. Uh, so you put a lot more traffic back on Iona. And uh, if it wasn't for the moving companies, there'd be no light there at all mm -hmm. on, on, that, on that street. And so... I don't know if pg and &E can help us putting something on a wooden pole out there on a couple of those, you know, it's kind of a temporary thing, but that's a real dangerous, uh, and as you know, there's no sidewalks there either, so. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, two years ago, we actually, um, we did a little street light project on, um, on right. Vine Street, just, um, just north of Iona, there to the, um, to the highway. We actually had uh, pg and &E we work with PG&E to have streetlights put on power poles. So, yeah, it would be some, it would be kind of a similar project that we did on Vine Street. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, just one last thing, you know, as far as trees go, if you look on Silverado, when you come off of uh, when you, when you come off of uh, 19th and you go Silverado West, um, you know, all those pine trees uh, on the south side, we pruned them. We pruned them really nice. Of course, that's not where the lights are. Um, but we've not done a good job of pruning those way back to allow more light on that uh, on that that street, particularly with the curve there. And uh, 
that shouldn't cost us a whole bunch to do a little better job of trimming those up and and uh, and let a little bit more light uh, on the street with, with those. Those pine trees are, you know, they're voracious in terms of their growth and and. And, and I, those are just on the those are just on the north side of Silverado. Is that is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. That would be on the north side. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. That's all I got. Frank, this is David Orr. I have one Sorry. question. You know about approximately not to a dollar amount, but about what it's cost for a one pole. Uh, we just recently uh, did a few. Um, they range um, somewhere, um, just materials is, is somewhere around $3,500 and probably another, you know, $2,500 to, um, to $3,000 to install um, a pole. Yeah, they're around six grand a pop is what we budget, yeah. I believe. Six or 6,500 each. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we try to buy, you know, we try to keep, uh, you know, a half dozen spur poles in our yard here for the ones that are hit. And yeah. so uh, we, we maybe get a little better, not much of a deal, but we, you know, but that's about what they cost uh, a couple years ago when I had ported some. Okay. I just was kind of, mm -hmm. it, it, it gives me information to know, you know. Sure. Uh -huh. And that cost is when there's power there already, you know, so. <laughs> All we're doing is kind of replacing something that got knocked down. So we're not having to bring power to that pole. We're just removing the old pole, whatever's left. And then, uh, you know, pouring the foundation, standing the pole up and then reconnecting it to the existing electrical source. And then if you're adding the PG&E side of that, that's PG&E's cost or our cost, but whatever PG&E charges to hook up. So I mean, probably yes. could easily be a couple thousand dollars for that too, if we had to bring power to it. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it's safe to say that one pole, no power, could be close to ten thousand dollars a pole. Oh, uh, it it could be. It could be, especially if it was yeah. Depending on where the power, you know, the power source may come from. Yeah. Uh, if the power's close by, it could be less. But yeah, if it's far away, it, it could be quite expensive. Yeah, Frank. This is Nathan. So just a couple comments on stuff that's being said on Silverado. Just know that there's two zones over there in the Lighting Landscape Maintenance District in PFMDs. So the the north side of Silverado, um, west of Acacia, has a lot more funding availability for, for the landscape and maintenance versus the rest of Silverado, which is an LLMD, and a lot of them are, are underfunded. So we provide the level of service that the funds provide. We are going back, back out to look at those contracts to try to improve that. So... That was one comment. And then just know when we're talking anything streetlight related, we are talking general fund and we're still at deficit spending in the general fund. So to address any of this or add extra without any grant monies, which we're working on that as well, um, something else would have to be impacted to make some of these changes and do these studies because those are straight general fund accounts. And um, I have researched some light polls I have found some decent lights out there, but um, what I keep finding is most of them are only on 20 foot poles, which don't meet the standard of, of the city for, for the long term. So we'll continue to search and look out of state, but some of the more common ones that I found are only 20 feet in height. So no. that's one of the other things we run into, but we'll, we'll continue to look down that trend. Yeah, I, I'd like you to do that because when I look at some of those they're they're not they're not uh, as high as they're they're not they're not higher than our uh, excuse me they're lower than our standard, but the cost of them is significantly less. You're talking about twenty five hundred three thousand dollars, and so if you if you went at something at twenty feet, you could put more of them out there. And I guess my other point is I know it's got to come out of a general fund, but like I said, I'd much rather ask for. Uh, improvements to the city in, in terms of taxes where city could, uh, where voters could see where the improvements are coming from and what they're going to be doing. And it, it affects safety. There's always a correlation between well-lit streets, traffic safety, as well as personal safety. So, uh, you know, something we need to think about. Yep, for sure. Okay, any more questions uh, regarding streetlights? 
Thank you. You're welcome. All right, our, our next topic is uh, signed retro reflectivity. So traf uh, traffic control signed retro, and I'm gonna mess this up several times, so excuse me, but uh, retro reflectivity um, it is, uh, well, re retro ret reflectivity is a property of a, of a service that allows large portions of light coming from a point source to be returned directly back to a point near its sign. So no matter what angle you're at, when light hits this, this, uh, this source, it, it bounces back. So that's how they kind of designed these, these new uh, sign services, um, which is in it to where no matter what angle you're at, when a light hits it, it comes back to you. And that's why you're able to see these things, you know, as soon as light um, hits them. Um, the uh, the uh, standards are governed by the California manuals manual on uniform traffic control devices. Um, current version is the 2014 California MUTCD uh, revision, revision five. Minimum maintained retro reflectivity levels are pro provided in section 2A-08 and table 2A-3 of the California MUTCD. Local, local agencies requirements to maintain minimum retro re reflectivity requirements also outlined in section 2A-08. Um, required to have, um, these are just some of the requirements that we have to uh, follow. Uh, required to have an assessment or management method that is des des designed to maintain sign retro reflectivity. Next page, please. Assessment or management methods per section. So these are some of the ways that we can we can monitor our, our signs. So uh, there's a visual nighttime inspection, train inspectors during nighttime conditions. Um, I, I feel, and I'm talking you know, that we can probably cover more more ground by doing this night um, nighttime inspection. Um, that's at the top of the list. Uh, measured sign retro reflectivity measured by retro re, retro reflector re, reflectometer. Excuse me, it's a tough one for me to <laughs> get out. Um, expected sign life, sign installation date tracked, and sign replaced at expected life. Blanket replacement, all signs in the are replaced at regular intervals. Uh, control signs, signs replaced based on control sign performance. Other methods based on engineering studies. <clears throat> Next slide, please. City of Lamore activity. Blanket replacement of safety signs uh, five, or, five or six years ago. So about five or six years ago, the city went through and replaced um, all the safety signs, signs that related to like traffic. Um, uh, uh, so the only thing that we, at that time that was not replaced are the street name signs. Um, but um, of course, uh, as a new subdivision is, is developed, we make sure that, that, well, this right currently the city installs street name signs. So we make sure that the street signs are meeting our, all of the MUTC uh, requirements. Um, and I kind of skipped ahead here, but um, new development requirements. Again, they, they make sure we make sure that all signs and any markers that are on the streets are, are current. Uh, whenever we do a street project, such as um, a street overlay um, uh, or maybe a, you know, a reclamite or chip seal, uh, the engineers will look at the entire project and determine if there's any signs that need to be replaced. And so we'll replace them um, at that time. Um, also, if, you know, we get a citizen call um, that we have a sign that maybe is not, you know, reflected at night, we'll, we'll send uh, someone out to replace that sign. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, um, uh, police uh, sometimes, you know, will notify uh, public works or, or even employees that are out and about at night if they notice a sign they'll inform um, staff um, uh, that we have a sign that just not, it's not, uh, it's not visible. Um, and then a formalized assessment management program. So we don't, 
we don't have a, a program right now, but we are talking about having a program that, um, that we will institute. Um, we, we talked about maybe um, incorporating this and in maybe in our, in our pavement management program. Um, so our pavement management program, um, what it does, it kind of gives us a um, timestamp of, of the conditions of our road. So it kind of, you know, tells us that, you know, you know, every at two years, you got to do a, you know, a crack fill project or, you know, five years, you might be doing, you know, a, a slurry or a chip seal. But when we get down to an overlay project, maybe that's when, you know, we, we go through and we change these signs. So by then it might be somewhere, you know, around, I don't know, seven, eight years down the road. And, and I believe the, the lifetime of some of these signs is, is around 10 years. Um, Jeff, I'm not sure if that was 10 years the correct uh, number is that? Yeah, that's kind of an average. It, aver it, kind of it an average. varies depending on the sign sometimes. Yeah. Next slide. Any questions uh, regarding this topic? Okay, if I have no questions, we'll move on to the last topic, uh, which is our sidewalk repair program. So in uh, fiscal year 2018-2019, uh, the city started a sidewalk repair program to assist property owners with repairing sidewalk issues, of, um, sidewalk issues abutting their properties and in the public right of way. The program was a 50% cost sharing program with a maximum reimbursement of $2,500 per property. Eligible, eligible expenses included sidewalk, tree removal, curb and gutter repair, and drive approach repair. This is uh, the, the flyer. Um, Amanda uh, did an excellent job in putting this together. Um, this is actually on our city website. Um, and also we have it here um, available at our CMC counters. Um, if you, if you look at this page. Um, uh, she's actually added um, uh, bullets to where, you know, uh, residents can, if they have questions um, about anything, I think she's pretty much covered everything. Uh, you can just click on that and it gets you into uh, different pages that just, there's a lot of information that um, I'd recommend you go onto the city website. Right now, uh, it's, it is available. It is, at, it's, no, I'm, as far as the, the, the program is not available, but the but the information is available. If you want to just go on there and see all of the uh, information that's that's on this page. But um, currently, um, uh, we do not this in this fiscal budget. We we did not have funds um, to um, uh, assist residents. Um, so hopefully um, next year um, we can bring this back. Um, next page, please. Well, I got a question for you, Frank. Sure. Um, so we, uh, because of budget issues, we pulled this program. Is that what you're saying? That's yes, sir. There this year. Okay. And yes, how sir. Did we allocate for it in the when we had it. Fifty thousand dollars. Just fifty k, huh? Yes. And that and that was general fund. Yes, sir. Um, so if I'm in a landscape lighting district uh, and my sidewalk's messed up. Uh, who funds that? Can I fund it out of my landscape lighting district or could I fund it out of the, this program here? The, uh, it depends. I think um, there may be just one um, lighting landscape district that we're looking to see if maybe the, um, the, the assessment included sidewalk repair. Um, we're we're kind of looking into that, but right now, yes, uh, you can participate um, and use um, money to assist you in, in those types of repairs. Yes. Well, I, I think that's important because the, the more uh, the more uses of those funds that we can do to improve neighborhoods and sidewalks, I think uh, you know citizens will be happy with that. Um, you know, using their using their tax dollars to improve their their, their areas. And uh, um, 
and it might be easier to get more people sign up for the sidewalk uh, approval or the, the if we amended those to make sure that let them vote on it, but make sure that it includes sidewalks as well, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or repairs. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, that way there's no pressure on the, on the general fund for that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, each property, I mean, there's the, you know, the, if the, if the resident has $2,500, I mean, $2,500 we're going to match. So, so he can do about $5,000 improvements. You know, so that, you it's know, a that's, kind of, yeah. that's a lot of, a lot of sidewalk. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gornick. This is Michelle. I just wanted to kind of give some insight. So in fiscal year 20, when we did fund the program at $50,000, we only had $16,000 in expenditures. And some of that was the city replacing city sidewalks. Um, it's really difficult to get the citizens to want to put up the $2,500 match. So um, well, although it was funded, we didn't see a lot of activity in the previous fiscal year. Well, then, I had, I had a couple of people in our area who, who said you guys turned them down because you didn't have any money. So that would have been this past year, but the prior year, we didn't budget in this year. Um, and then the first year we did it, we actually budgeted 100000 and we only had $30,000 worth of submittals. And then it dropped down to thirteen. So with the budget restraints and the cuts and we were laying people off, we went and we um, cut wherever we could. So how did we advertise it? Just on a website? Website, we put it out at council. It was on the Facebook page. Um, it was uh, here at the offices. Yeah, but I mean, that, you know, that's not enough. We got to send them in a, send them an address or send, send it to their house, let them know it's available. I mean, you know, Again, kind of yeah, I, I don't disagree on some of that, but yeah. um, mailers to ma uh, city mailers about $6,000 by the time we, we mail everything out to alert all the residents on stuff. And, and that's a, again, a general fund expense of, of six grand. Nathan, and, uh, that's what we gotta do. I mean, you know, we're in the business of serving the people. It's gonna cost money to do it. So you gotta spend money to make money. Well, you can't spend money you don't have. And this budget was uh, approved by council with the cuts in it. So if they, they no, were you aware didn't of it. it all either, right? What's that? You didn't spend it all either. No, but we used it for other repairs and in streets where we needed it. Then when we have monies in these accounts, say, okay, well, we need to do this over here. Okay, well, there's still some dollars left here. You know, we can do transfers like that, but it has to be spent on, on you know, general fund items and, and sidewalks and ADA and things of that nature. No argument there. Yep. Yeah, so so the calls that we've been getting on uh, this fiscal year, uh, we, uh, we've been actually, you know, taking their name, telling them that if, if funds become available next year, we'll be sure to contact them. So, um, we do have a list. Uh, so yeah, if you know of anybody, um, you know, have them call us and we can just put them on the list and be ready. You'll uh, start off of that list then, huh? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. So this, uh, so this sheet here just kind of gives you a, a summary of, of how we did, um, when it first started. So uh, 2018, 2019, we had 18 applicants uh, were approved. And uh, that whole year, uh, we expended $30,609 uh, was reimbursed for sidewalk repairs. In 2019 to, to 20, we had eight, eight applicants um, were approved. And um, we um, reimbursed uh, them $13,320 uh, for sidewalk repairs. And then again, the 2020, 2021, um, that was not part of our, our budget, so. If, if you had, uh, you said you had eight applicants and the other one you had 18 applicants approved, were, were there some not approved? Well, um, no, um, all of them were, all of them were, yeah, anybody that applied, I, I, I don't know of a situation where they did not meet the, uh, the requirements. Um, uh, I'm not aware of them. So um, Thank we, you. Um, we even had some that we actually had sent notice uh, to because, you know, we were notified of trip hazard. So uh, those people were able to take advantage of, 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 the, of this program. And so, you know, we helped them in that situation where we had actual calls um, of residents who were just complaining of a trip hazard. And so uh, we were happy to be able to assist them, you know, uh, up to $2,500. 
Good. All right, the city, um, the city has a few ways uh, uh, cons concerns can be brought to staff's attention. Um, residents may call our office. Uh, there's a phone number and an ex extension. Re residents may visit our offices at 711 Cinnamon Drive, although COVID has made this a little more difficult. Um, resident residents may submit concerns via the city website. And the city website is the easiest um, way that, that we can be reached. And this is, if you go to the page, um, there is the, uh, the link um, that you can actually um, uh, email uh, Public Works and we will assign it a, um, we'll assign it to the appropriate um, division, whether it be a, you know, a, a sidewalk issue, uh, whether, you know, someone has, um, you know, a leaking meter, uh, whatever the issue might be, um, they can go into this uh, link fill in the, uh, the appropriate boxes here. And, um, and then a job order is uh, sent to, uh, to city staff, depending on what the uh, issue is. Council, this is Nathan. What I like about this tool is we get an electronic stamp of when it was sent in. As the work is assigned to a division, the person that requested this gets an email to keep them updated. And when the Whenever we've, you know, resolved or denied the claim, they get an email stating that it was work was completed and or it was denied because of this reason type thing. So it kind of closes the loop. But this is this is a great tool for like if you have that one off sign that you don't really think is good. Um, so it can help us help ourselves. So instead of spending last time I looked in 2016, I think it was for reflect retro reflectivity study, it was almost $20,000 to have them do the study. This is a way though, if you have a sign that you want us to look at, you could write it up, we could go out and do an inspection ourselves, you know, and then say, oh yeah, definitely it's, it's, it's not reflective because there's different ways you can do the test, but this is a good way here to target specific areas of residents' concerns. So yeah. I, 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 it's, it's, it's definitely an underutilized tool the city has currently. Uh, Nathan and uh, Frank, both of you, um, how many, this is great for the citizens, but how many of our employees, uh, whether they be uh, uh, our refuse collectors or police, volunteer fire, uh, uh, maintenance workers, how many of them are encouraged to submit requests about things they see when they're out so we ask them to do it all the time. I know PD is probably the most active because they're out at night. So they're, you know, they'll, they'll call in for street lights that they see out a lot and things like that. Um, the water and sewer guys, they'll, they'll alert some potholes and if they see something new like that, but the expectation is that everyone in the city looks for improvements um, and reports them. But I do think that that's an area where we actually can get better at. Yeah, it'd be great to, yep. you know, incentivize yep. that or give some rewards out to people who look out for that stuff. That's great. great. Absolutely. Thank you. Great job, Frank. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Frank. I appreciate that. Lots of information for us to digest. You're welcome. Um, next, we have SS-2, Lamore Police Department, CSO Program Overview with Chief Kendall. So good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Matthews and council members. I appreciate the time you are allowing me to provide you with an overview of what our CSO program is about and how they operate on a daily basis. When the uh, department designed our CSO program or our community services officer program, it was developed to alleviate some of the duties that would otherwise fall on a patrol officer. The 
creation of the CSO program allows patrol officers to focus on more serious in nature crimes, as well as creating the opportunity to develop community oriented programs to better work in partnership with the community and provide the, and, and maintain uh, the current programs that were already in place. Our CSO unit is really split into two different entities. Uh, one full-time CSO focuses almost exclusively on animal control duties uh, and calls for service. The uh, second full-time CSO focuses more on our community-based programs and services, as well as uh, code enforcement. The third and part-time CSO assists with covering when one of the full-time CSOs are out due to vacation or sick, as well as taking on her own workload pertaining to property management or community-based programs. <clears throat> so again, when the CSO program was developed, its purpose was to create a better working relationship with the citizens of Lemoore and the police department. Some of these programs implemented included uh, crime-free multi-housing, the neighborhood watch program, national night out, the red ribbon week, presence on patrol, uh, and reasons for the season. Uh, our CSOs also oversee our crossing guards, ensuring we have coverage at uh, each intersection throughout the school year and lead our volunteers and policing program, which includes the uh, Citizens Academy. Uh, several years ago, the city had a full-time code enforcement officer, uh, which did not fall under the police department. When that position was abolished, some of those duties fell on to the CSOs as collateral duties. In uh, 2020, the CSOs handled 453 property maintenance cases. This is on top of all the community-based programs we run, as well as the uh, over 1,100 animal control calls for service we received that year. <clears throat> when a code enforcement complaint comes in, uh, we always try to gain voluntary compliance first. Uh, typically we do, but during the fire season, we see more properties being abated for uh, weed control. When a complaint is received, one of our CSOs will attempt to make contact with an owner and issue them a warning to correct the action within 10 days. If the problem is not addressed after the 10 days, we will recontact the owner and make a determination uh, to proceed with the abatement process. Ultimately, uh, when we uh, do have to abate a property and per the city ordinance, the property owner is served a notice to abate via certified mail along with a public nuisance letter, which provides the owner uh, a formal opportunity to correct the violation. If the violations are not corrected, the item is placed on the agenda and we bring the matter before city council. Uh, the city council at the next regular meeting may pass a resolution declaring the violations and setting a hearing date. The city clerk will mail a copy of the resolution to the property owner at least 10 days prior to the hearing date. And then the police department in turn will post the resolution on the property, citing the date and time the person responsible will have to attend the city council meeting to be heard on the objections. Uh, when it comes back to council after uh, hearing uh, any objections, you will then uh, make a final decision as to whether or not to abate the property. Um, and again, that was kind of a brief overview, you know, a real quick overview of what uh, our CSOs are doing on a daily basis and how they're addressing uh, some of these code enforcement issues. So I'll entertain any questions. Um, yeah, Chief Kendall, it's Frank Winnick. Um, when you, um, uh, with respect to the process, you said that there's a uh, citation or a warning, warning first. Uh, they got 10 days of reply. Um, and uh, if they don't, then you take the matter to the city council. And the city council, um, here's the case. And if they want to hear it, uh, how is it adjudicated there at the, at the first issue with the city council? Is it that you get direction from them to go back and see if you can do it, 
persuade them or tell me a little bit? Uh, it, it's, it's really um, at that point you, uh, the reason I ask is I've got, I've had citizens contact me about uh, violations of automobiles for 10 years or more, okay, on the sides of their houses. And um, uh, nothing's happened. We've gone through the city. So I just want to know where the process stopped. Is the, does the council lose, uh, lose its appetite to make a decision about this stuff? Or did somebody come in and says they don't have the money? Or you know, why, what, why are we not cleaning some of this stuff up? Well, I've kind of seen it go both ways. Um, ultimately, the council has to um, form a resolution on the matter for us to be able to uh, take any type of action. Um, so a lot of the times on, on vehicles, we're dealing with um, uh, you know, where they're actually located on the person's property. Are they behind a fence? Are they on, on, uh, in the parking lot if, or not the parking lot, but the driveway? So on the driveway, we can go ahead and abate the process. Uh, and, and really, it's just... The way I read the code, if it's behind a fence and you can't see it, that's different than if it's out in front. Right. You're 100% you're correct. Okay. Um, but we do get a lot of those calls coming in saying, hey, why aren't you taking care of this property with this car in the, the backyard that hasn't moved? Um, so, again, we, we typically we take them on a... Uh, a case by case basis for us, we always want voluntary compliance. Sure. Um, and we typically get voluntary compliance. We very rarely have to bring a case uh, before council uh, for an abatement on vehicles. It's mainly, again, it's mainly weeds during well, fire season. I, I guess the other question I have, Chief, is is this standard practice that it comes before council or? Or is it usually left with the authority of the police in terms of enforcing the code? It's, it's no, actually. To, oh, go ahead, Chief. Well, for us to for us to take any type of action um, on and during the abatement process, it has to go to council. Well, I really, and we have to follow our city ordinance, which says we do. Mm -hmm. Our city ordinance says we have to give them a ten day warning. We no. have to take. We have to have it delivered certified mail. So. I have no problem with that. I guess my question is, though, after that process of a warning, is that standard operating procedure for the council to get that involved in it, or what's your okay. experience in terms of in terms of the city? In terms no, of um, um, Chief Kendall, it's it's actually required by your municipal code that it go to council. I it's, realize it's, that. I'm, I'm, okay, Mary, I'm just asking him what is I, what is. What are his preferences? I know I'm putting them on the Oh, spot. okay. Gotcha. Oh, no. Um, I mean, you know, honestly, in way, I just want to know in terms of you being able to administer the code, is the council cumbersome for you guys to make your job easier to administer? The no, code? I think over the years, we've cleaned up uh, our ordinance to where we have really streamlined it with, uh, it, it's, it's relatively streamlined. And, for city government, I guess, because it's still going to take the least amount of time to abate a vehicle would probably be around 45 days yeah. when you figure it's got to go back to, you know, on agenda or hearing uh, certified mail, things like that. I don't think there's any way we can streamline it any further. I know in the past it used to be we would have to give them uh, two warnings before we could even send out a certified letter. Uh, well, that's 20 days on the short side of things. So I think we've streamlined a lot more and this is, is really, uh, it's not gonna get any quicker. Unless you, unless you decided to just make it 45 days to get it done uh, or, and then you come in and take it out. I mean, instead of it going to the council. Uh, I'd have to defer to Mary on that one. I think it, uh, I think no, you have, have to change. have a resolution yeah, for, for the law. I understand that, I understand that. Okay. So, Chief, let me get this straight. So, basically, to to get like I'm talking about vehicles, just vehicles that are parked in, in out people's front of their houses on the side of their houses for weeks, months, or whatever. Can the homeowner contact 
who in the department to to get this started process. I know I have some people that have contacted me too that the cars have been out there for two, three months, some of them for years. Um, and we're going to go over one more thing about downtown that I want to address too. But so they would contact the citizen on patrol people or would they contact? You know, yeah, they could just call um, the non-emergency line uh, into the lobby, 924-9574. Um, and uh, um, they'll get it over to the code enforcement officer. Okay. Because that's, I have a, a couple that are especially, they're talking about there's big rigs in some of our, you know, in some of our streets, there's just big rigs parked there, trailers and big rigs. And, and I know that I don't think they're allowed inside the city. Um, right. They, typically with the big rigs, they'd be off the truck route and we could address that uh, a little bit more streamlined than. Yeah, so I think the big rigs are a little bit different, but yeah. So that's yeah. basically what I wanted to find out about that. And then I guess this next question is um, downtown. There's some uh, apartments, I guess, downtown businesses that have apartments on the second floor. Right. And obviously they can park on the street. Um, have we ever looked at doing something to, because I was down at a local business a couple weeks ago and these vehicles look like there's a handful of them that look like they haven't moved in months. And yes. there's, you know, piles of leaves underneath it. There's, those leaves are going to go into those uh, gutters that are going to cause problems for our storm drains, for the, the draining of water. I mean, um, quite frankly, in front of Newman Garcia, right. the leaves were so bad there that and this last rain probably went into that, um, those little, the pipes they have underneath the flower bed, the planter boxes, they clog those up. It's a wrap. They're going to flood into, into these businesses and, uh, I really like to try to figure out what we can do with some of that parking because it took me, not that I'm anybody, but it took me about 40 minutes to find a parking spot to go to Newman Garcia's right. to do something. And according to them, that's a daily event for them. Right. And, and in all honesty, we're working on that right now. We are relatively close to, hopefully finding a solution to that. And I think we have a good plan moving forward. So um, uh, hopefully that'll alleviate that issue. Okay. And will that plan have to go through the city council or no, or you guys will just. No, uh, I believe we're all done. We have uh, the signs. We're, we're essentially just waiting on uh, signage at this point. Can I ask what, what the it's going to be? So maybe get yeah. some, so, some ideas. Uh, Lieutenant Smith went, went through and did a study of uh, essentially our, our entire downtown and uh, making some of that, uh, that parking, uh, two hour parking, and then making that, um, that where you're talking about specifically out front of the uh, Ander Hotel, um, that they have to move their cars on uh, specific days so we can uh, get the, the street sweeping, um, you know, uh, cleaning equipment in there. Uh, on a regular basis. Cool. Great. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Absolutely. Uh, Chief, one more question. Do, do we handle, uh, do we handle uh, recreational campers and sea uh, trains the same way with abandoned vehicles? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, well, I take that back. Uh, the ordinance for our uh, re uh, recreational vehicles is pretty straightforward. Uh, you can't have a, uh, an RV on the roadway in excess of 72 hours unless it's signed off um, uh, for basically a temporary use permit or through me. Um, at that point, we typically, again, we wanna get voluntary compliance first, uh, but the ordinance uh, now has a um, a storage authority uh, that allows us to um, store those vehicles. A couple of years ago, the uh, state law came out saying the uh, Community Caretaking Act kind of prevented some of our um, 
our tows to where we couldn't uh, tow vehicles under the vehicle code. And now we have a, a city ordinance that allows us to tow those vehicles just pertaining to RVs. Uh, the C trains <clears throat> or any type of storage container uh, that they put in a driveway, um, we would abate at the, uh, the same process. And same thing if it's on the side of the house? Okay. Correct. Well, if it's behind the, uh, uh, behind the fence line. Um, Just through here, then, then they would have to have a permit to put it there, right? On the driveway, correct. No, I mean, in the, either on the driveway or behind the fence. Isn't there a requirement in terms of amount of feet between the... In all honesty, I, I don't know if there is behind the fence line. Um, we would, the way we have the kind of the code enforcement um, working, some of those complaints would fall to, um, to the city for direction. So if it's behind the fence line, we typically don't have uh, any jurisdiction over that. Well, you could put one behind it next to your house and then build a fence out and put it put it behind the fence. Right? So that's my point. We got a couple of those. In the area. Okay. Yeah, that we we take those as individuals, and it would depend on where they're at because we do have setbacks and there's certain codes that you got to be so far away from fence lines and property lines and can't be so tall, and that would probably be more coming out of the building. The building department or community development to assist PD if they had complaints on that. Okay. All right. Now, Thanks. Chief, one one more question about the recreational vehicles. Um, can they be like a lot of people have uh, RV parking on the side of their house, and most people have RV parking that goes from the street all the way back to the side of their house. Can that RV or trailer uh, whatever you want to call it, be parked on their property in their driveway, lack of a better word, or, or a second driveway in front of the fence, or does it have to be behind the fence? Off the top of my head, I would have to do some research on that. Um, so, um, your, your municipal code says storage of automobile, motorcycle, boat, or other watercraft and trailer or parts thereof on residential properties within the front or side yard unless parked on a paved driveway or screened from view by um, a minimum six foot high solid fence. So it has to be behind the fence. Or in a paved driveway, it says or. Or, so if it's on a paved, like concrete driveway, then it's okay? According to what your municipal code says, storage, unless yeah. parked on a paved driveway or screened from view well, by a minimum six foot high solid fence. And that's my understanding, unless it uh, blocks the um, the sidewalk right away. Okay. Uh, that, that's the other problem we have with that code, because the way I read that, uh, Mary, is it conflicts with the rule of reasonableness. If you got a vehicle <laughs> that's been driven for 20 years, sitting on the side of a house on a concrete slab, but it's not behind a fence, well, I guess I could argue if that was my vehicle. Hey, it's on a private. It's on a slab. You know, it's next to my house. But I, if I were a fireman, I'd also argue that's impeding my progress to the back of that house. I can't get around it. Yeah. No. Yeah, definitely rule of reasonableness. You're right. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Nice job, Chief. Thanks. Anybody have any other questions? No. Well, looks like that concludes our study session and we're gonna get ready to go into closed session. Mayor Pro Tem Matthews, you're gonna to wanna to read through the closed sessions one, two, and three um, before you adjourn to closed session. Gotcha. Uh, this item has been placed, sorry, set aside for city council to meet in closed session to discuss matters pursuant to the government and people are in front of that one. So I'm gonna go ahead and read this one. <laughs> government code section 54956.9 uh, 
D4. The city attorney will provide an oral report regarding the closed session at the beginning of the next regular city council meeting. Uh, number one, government code section 54956.9, conference with legal counsel, exposure to litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to paragraph two or three of subdivision D of section 54956.9, uh, one case. Number two, conference with labor negotiator, government code section 54957, Point six, agency designated representatives, Mary Lerner, city attorney, attorney and Michelle Spear, assistant city manager. Uh, employee organizations, General Association of Service Employees, Lamore Police Officers Association, Lamore Police Sergeants Unit, uh, Police Professionals, Professional Services Bargaining Unit, and unrepresented. Number three, government code section 54956.8. A uh, conference with real property negotiators, property APN S024 uh, 080 876 and 024 080 074. Uh, agency negotiator Nathan Olson, city manager, under negotiation price and terms. If you could read the very last small print. That in the event that all the items on the closed session agenda have not been deliberated in the time provided, the city council may continue the closed session at the end of the regularly scheduled council meeting. Let's see, so this is the regular session. Uh, what is it? Starting at 7.36. What's the 7.30 session? Although I'll be at late. Sorry. Uh, so call to order and we'll have the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. If you'd please stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the much needed rain. We ask that you be with staff and council this evening as they address the matters before the city. And we just want to lift up all our first responders out there for keeping us safe and doing what they do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the of the United amen. States of America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God. Indivisible, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. So I will do the Oh my gosh. There we go. <laughs> Video problems. Okay, so roll call, Marissa. Okay, so Council Member Cheney? Here. Council Member Gornick? He's muted. Is he here? Council Member here. Orff? Mayor Pro Tem Matthews? Here. And Mayor Neal, or sorry, <laughs> Mayor Lyons. <laughs> have it absent okay thank you okay so closed session report i'm present um, sorry yes so um thank you mayor pro tem matthews um we do have something to report out there was a motion made by council member gornick with a second by council member orth to use wastewater enterprise funds to purchase the properties with APN 024080076 and 024080074 um, for the city to run treated wastewater on. Each member voted yes as follows, Mr. Gornick, yes, Mr. Orth, yes, Mr. Cheney, yes, Ms. Matthews, yes, with Mayor Lyons absent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, agenda approval additions and or deletions. 
we yeah. don't have any. So, there are um, none. <laughs> public comment. Public comment will be in accordance with the attached policy. This time is reserved for members of the audience to address the city council on items of interest that are not on the agenda and are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. It is recommended that speakers limit their comments to three minutes each and is it is requested that no comments are made during this period on items on the agenda. The council is prohibited by law from taking any action on ma matters discussed that are not on the agenda. Prior to addressing the council, any handout for council will be provided to the city clerk for distribution to the council and appropriate staff. Anybody have any public comment? I'm trying to pull up the chat, but I don't I believe Michael Day has raised his hand. Does he know to unmute himself? Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I just wanted to give you all a bit of an update. Um, over the weekend this past Saturday, the Lamore Rotary Club held their crab feed. Um, despite the circumstances, it was very different from what has been held in the past. But it was a successful event and just wanted to send a big old thank you to everyone who bought tickets and people that you know came through and helped out and volunteered, all the sponsors and partners, the people who own businesses who let us hang up signs in, the, in their doors and windows, and um, the volunteers from the Interact Club. And then also uh, two good old boys from the Lamore Volunteer Fire Department, uh, Mark and Matthew, wanted to send a special shout out to them. I got to work with them on the barbecue team. So I just wanted to show my appreciation um, personally and on behalf of the Lamore Rotary Club for, for the community support. Really appreciate that. And with the uh, proceeds, we're gonna be able to do a lot of good things in our community. So uh, thank you all for that. Okay. Thank you. Any other public comment? Doesn't look like we have any. Uh, ceremonial presentation, section one. We have no ceremonial presentations. Uh, department and city manager reports, section two. Department yeah, we'll uh, two dash one. Sorry. Yeah, we'll department start out. And with, city manager reports. I'm sorry. We'll start out with uh, Miss Miss Spears is going to give an update on the audit. Good, good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem and Council, or good evening. Um, I wanted to give you guys a brief update. So um, at the next council meeting on February 16th, um, I'm not quite sure if he's going to be in person or on Zoom, but Brian Henderson with Hudson Henderson, they are auditors, is going to be present. Our 2020 or fiscal year 2020 audit is finally complete. Um, it's good news. So um, they're still working on the final numbers, but if you'll recall for fiscal year 20, we had taken a budget that estimated a $3.9 million deficit. It looks like we only had a deficit. deficit. It looks like we only had a deficit of about 1.1 million. Um, that's largely in part because we received more sales tax and property tax than was originally estimated. And if you'll recall, we did some significant um, reduction in force in general fund departments last year, which saved us a considerable amount of money. Um, and so that's great news. Well, final numbers for you next week. It just means our position beginning fiscal year 21 was is better than we anticipated. And so um, I also wanted to report out that doing an analysis of the revenues thus far this year, it looks like we're gonna be at a minimum $500,000 to the good. So our sales tax and our property tax for the current fiscal year are coming in stronger than projected. And the biggest contributor to our, our increase or our good fortune is our cannabis revenue that we're receiving from our dispensaries. Um, in the fiscal year 21 budget, I only estimated about $200,000 in revenue from those dispensaries. And it looks like we're gonna probably exceed $500,000 for the year. Um, these are fluid numbers, anything can change. Um, I have not yet done an analysis um, on our expenditures just because we're only halfway through the year and there are so many things that can still change. But I'm hoping that the end of this year will not result in a $2.9 million deficit. I'm hoping it's gonna end up somewhere between you know 2.4 to two even. So we're making up some of that, that loss and we're gonna continue to do everything in our power to bring in businesses and to continue to shore up that gap. Thank you, Michelle. Thank Up you, next Michelle. would be Frank Rivera, Public Works Director. 
Uh, good evening, Mary, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and uh, Council members. Have a couple things to update you on. Um, some of you might be aware of, um, uh, but uh, end of last year, we uh, we actually took a uh, the building on the corner of uh, E Street and Highland Street to uh, Council to uh, to start the abatement process. Uh, the building had some structural uh, issues that caused the alley to be shut down um, between um, Fox and Highland. Um, uh, at the last meeting, uh, the previous council had given the owners uh, time to um, come up with some options on whether to try to repair the building or to demo the building. Uh, I met with uh, Sherry uh, Hospital. She's a daughter of the Lewis family. Um, and at the meeting, she informed me that uh, the family is, is their, their direction is to actually demolish the building. So the building that's at the very corner of yeah. Highland and, um, and E Street from uh, the low line, low line sports building around the corner on Highland Street to the, um, I think it's the El Rancho Market, that will all be removed down to the slab, uh, probably beginning uh, within the next two to four weeks. So I just wanna update you on that. Um, the other thing is um, well number 10, I'm sure if you know anything about our, our, our well number 10, but that was our, one of our workhorses. It's been down for about maybe two and a half years uh, started off with just a general maintenance um, um, a job that we were we were doing during the uh, off off uh, season. It turned out that uh, during the uh, removal of the well casing that there was subsidence, so we couldn't get the casing out. Anyway, the project just kept growing as far as uh, problems and expenses. So what started off to be a, a project that was in 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 the realm of like fifty to hundred thousand uh, dollars ended up costing the city. Uh, like about five hundred fifty thousand dollars, but uh, as of last week, it is up and running. Uh, again, is it is one of our workhorses for the city. It pumps out about twenty two hundred gallon uh, th twenty two hundred gallons a minute. So we're happy to have that back and then online to um, help us through the uh, the next um, the ne next summer that we have coming uh, uh, ahead of us. Um, and then I, I just kind of want to shout a little kudos to the uh, sewer department. Um, during the storm, uh, they spent many hours, day and night, uh, you know, hitting the, the problem areas that we have throughout town. Um, uh, but we seem to get through it uh, this year. We just had a lot of rain to contend with. So, uh, but they spent many, many hours, um, uh, you know, kicking on pumps and, and uh, moving water best they can just to kind of clear up those trouble areas as, as best they could in a timely manner. So uh, anyway, that's what I, that's all I have for you. Thanks, Frank. The only thing I would add to that is well 10 when it went down for regular maintenance, the issues around that well were all around subsidence. So it started crushing cases and it was very difficult to remove the, the columns and get everything back together. So it took significant efforts to get that well back up and a lot of reinforcement to uh, help with future subsidence. So thanks, Frank. You're welcome. That's it for department <laughs> reports. Thank you all. Oh, wait, I'm, I am uh, sorry. I missed calendar, section. I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem. Oh. Um, this weekend out at West Hills College, they did hold a vaccination clinic for those in our community 65 and older. And I believe they vaccinated about 537 seniors. So uh, shout out to Kristen Clark in the, the county for putting that together and then um, city staff, uh, PD and and them for uh, in maintenance for getting the electronic signs and the uh, appropriate um, signage out there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is the consent calendar section three items considered routine in nature are placed on the consent calendar. They will be all be considered and voted upon in one vote as one item unless the council member or member of the public request individual consideration. Uh, we have 3-1, approval of minutes for the regular meeting, January 19th, 2021. No move. I have a motion from council member Gornick. A second. I have a second from council member Cheney. Um, council you member the Gornick. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> council member Gornick, how do you vote? 
Aye. Uh, Council Member Cheney? Aye. Council Member Ord? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Consent calendar passes, public hearing, section four, report discussion and or other council action will be taken. We have no public hearing. So down to new business, section five, report discussion and or other council action will be taken. 5-1, report and recommendation, city council meeting schedule, Mr. Olson. Okay, good evening again, Mayor Pro Tem and council members. So this item was placed on the uh, agenda at the request of council to look at our meeting times and dates in conjunction with all the other meetings going on in the area and with meetings that um, our electeds sit on different boards and committees. Um, Marissa, do you have the calendar? Can you pull that up? Yeah. Okay, there it is. Any chance you can make it a little bigger? <laughs> all right, good job. Thank you. So at, at first glance, this is more of a, of a you know, a council request, but I'll just point out, um, looking at the calendar, um, I see the only real potential, and part of this request came as if we did our study sessions a little earlier and started the meetings earlier, is that we'd have more city staff that would be available, especially those that are in, you know, hourly employees that wouldn't require overtime and stuff, so they could come forth and, and get in front of the council and, you know, um, be available. And then, maybe starting the regular meetings a little bit earlier. So if you look at the existing calendar, Tuesdays right now um, would be an option if we wanted to do something of that nature, we could keep the, the same schedule the first and third Tuesday of the month. And at council's direction, um, we could start study session as early as 3, 3.30 in the afternoon and then maybe move regular, section, regular session to, to say 5.30 or six, these are just me talking, but this is actually, we're gonna get direction from, from council on that. Thursdays is also available if we would do like the second and fourth um, meetings on Thursday or the second and fourth, yeah, Thursdays of the month because there is one of the, there's a commission on aging meeting in late afternoon and then the South Fourth Kings ground GSA is a 5.30 at night meeting. So um, those dates wouldn't work because we'd be missing council members for the meeting. And then there's obviously um, Mondays, which are a little crazy around here uh, for city staff. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of Monday night meetings because we're usually trying to settle in from the weekend and, and put out any fires that we may have had. And then um, Friday, I just don't know how how many willing participants we get out of the community if we try to hold Friday evening meetings. So at that point, that's kind of a, a brief overview. I'll open it up for comments or questions from council. Um, this is uh, Frank uh, talking. I, I asked for this request and I really want to thank staff for doing it. It uh, really gives us a good idea of how busy uh, the community is. Um, um, as I look at it, I like the idea of possibly doing a, a 3 or 3.30 study session and then uh, city council meeting um, uh, after that. Um, on, we could keep the Tuesday or Thursday or, or Tuesday first and third or did something like a, uh, a, a second and fourth on a Thursday where there's really nothing in that might even give more community members an opportunity to come because they might not be doing other stuff uh, during the during the week. Just a thought. Yeah, matching up on the second and fourth Tuesday would put us on the same schedule as Avenel's city council meetings. And um, I don't really think that'll impact thing. I mean, I think it'd, it'd be a good a good option. Yeah. Now, Mayor, uh, this is for the city attorney. So, Mary, this will require an ordinance change, correct? Correct. So, um, council would give direction tonight, and then what would happen is um, a, a ordinance would come back to you based on that direction for an introduction and first reading. Um, and then you could have a second reading. Um, you only need five days in between, noting that the second reading has to be at a regular meeting. Um, and then you have to wait 30 days in order to implement. Now, if council wanted to start that new schedule sooner, it could, but the meetings would just need to be noticed as special meetings. 
Um, we would possibly, if there were during that time, something that required um, was required to be heard at a, re at a regular meeting, you may have to go back to your original schedule for that purpose only during that um, time period. Okay. So that's and the process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary. And at what point do we want to, do we open this up for public comment? After um, council talks about it or is that yes. the appropriate thing? No. After council talks about it. Okay, thank you. Does any other council have any discussion on this? Okay. I like it. Like... I like words. Oh. But I mean, I'm, I'm open. I just, I, I don't think we need to get into the middle of uh, families having dinner. I think most families you could say have dinner between five and five thirty, six o'clock area. So I, my, my two cents was we don't want to get into that aspect of it. Um, three o'clock, there's a lot of people for, well, for us, we get out, we do our study session from three to whatever that, but then it, it now causes problems with dinner and all that. I, I, I understand, uh, Mr. Gornick's, um, it is late, but I think for the public, I think it's better to be later to make sure they get the family stuff they need to get done so they can now join us to do city business with us. My two cents. I agree with Mr. Orth, and uh, I, I agree with all the comments he, he made. Yeah, I know we talked about this at city council meetings not that far in the past, um, and it seemed like the public really was not feeling that because a lot of them, you know, work and work till five, don't have time to get here. Um, and again, like Mr. Orth said, the, the dinner situation, that, that could be an issue for families as well. Um, but I, I'm curious to see if it's still an issue for the public. Um, so if nobody has any other comments or questions, I'll go ahead and open that up for the public. Does anybody in the public have anything? Do we have any idea of how many people we, uh, in the public we have on our Zoom meetings? Yeah, there's currently 16 participants minus four, five, six, seven, oh, minus staff. So let me think here. One, two, three, four, five. Five. We have five members of the public watching right now. Okay. And I believe Miss Solis has her hand up. Yes. <clears throat> Yes. Um, hello. I was thinking about this kind of process because we have changed to Zoom um, with the meetings and we have also allowed public comment to be written in. And so I think it would be prudent if the council, you know, just picked a time that was good for them and the city staff. But I also think that there should be a limit to the length of meetings. And I don't know if that is something that can be implemented because even when the meetings are at 7.30, if they go to 11.30 PM, that's really hard for people you know, of the public to attend. And I'm sure it's hard for the city council to even listen <laughs> you know, at that, at that point, um, especially. So just an idea. I did like the proposal of doing the study session at three o'clock and then having the meeting at either four or five, but then you would need to limit it, you know, no longer than maybe seven, so they could have um, dinner. I just think there's ways now that we can communicate that don't need to be live. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Anybody else? Doesn't look like we have any other public comment. Okay, you can bring it back to council for further discussion. Okay, uh, bring it back to council for further discussion. <laughs> One of the things that Jennifer had mentioned was, um, sorry, Ms. Mrs. Solis had mentioned was um, because it's on Zoom. Uh, I don't, I don't think we should ne necessarily consider like if we're going to change our ordinance. This isn't going to affect just when we're on Zoom, so we do need to consider that we will be back in public meetings where people can attend. So we have to keep that in mind. So we're not maybe potentially later doing another ordinance change because it's not working out for the public. 
in person. So keep that in mind as well. Well, let me ask this question. Uh, uh, we would still be televising these meetings on Zoom, right? Yes. So Not I don't know if we do it exactly via Zoom. We do do well, but, uh, uh, YouTube I mean, live. I don't know, yeah. Nathan. I think, uh, but individual could still send in a question or during comment period and things of that nature. So my, my only thought is if we did, we, there might be a compromise of both if we did the time frame because we could also advertise this is the meeting day if you have a question and let's say you can't get to the meeting but you want to submit the question at 12 o'clock before the before the meeting an individual can submit the question right and they just send it to the city clerk and and they could read it off to us and we could respond to it and yes count council members i think right now we have um for like a regular meeting we have a 4 p.m cutoff because you know, again, getting things ready for study session, we, we, and to give staff time to see, you know, what comes in. So yeah, we definitely do that. We just don't allow public, con that's for public comment. So public comment, we kind of cut off at like 4 p.m. in the afternoon. I think she's gone as, as much up to five as she gets it, but we'll guarantee we'll get it out if you get it in by that time. Yeah. And then when we do questions like this, yeah, it's open to the public. Yeah, exactly. So I, I would just I would just think we'd be able to get greater exposure and incorporate more more staff if we did it uh, if we did like a three o'clock study session for a half hour and then starting the meetings at four or something like that at three thirty. Uh, you know, meeting two meeting two times a month, I think we can get a lot done. Uh, I don't think we have to have meetings till eleven o'clock at night. Gosh, that scared me when I heard somebody <laughs> Jennifer said that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll be happy to do without all whatever you'd like, but those are my thoughts. So again, this, this item's up for direction from council on how you want us to proceed. So um Patricia, what do you think? Um, I, I'm just kind of used to them being, uh, what they are now, just cause I've been attending them for a few years that way. Um, so for me, it's like the creature of habit, not that I don't like, not like change. Um, I'm okay with that, but I mean, I'm also okay with the way it's been. So that's my personal preference. Okay. Oh, I'll, I'll make, uh, I'll make a motion that at this time we just leave it the way it is and we look forward maybe to changing it in the future um in the future but leave it the way it is now and we'll just kind of through our study sessions maybe kick it around and see if more people want to get involved in changing it uh dave you know that's a good idea and maybe what we could do is uh between now and let's say let's look at it another six months uh, but maybe we could take the attendance either both on Zoom and also in person and, and see what the attendance is. You know, I mean, if, if we're only getting a dozen people, I mean, uh, maybe, it, maybe it is too late. Maybe, they, maybe we need to find something else. Maybe we do in the morning or something. I don't know. But uh, or now, Council, may I, may I offer up that maybe we could do like a, uh, a survey monkey or do kind of a, a public poll or survey just to kind of see if People like it as is or would like to see it a little earlier and then at least that way we'd have some input that we could bring back and say hey according to the poll numbers this is it because depending on what's on the agenda I mean that's it's exciting that's going that's on that. nobody shows up but if you get that hot button topic a lot of people show up so that would be a great idea uh, we'll, we'll do I, that and bring that I back. have to admit some of the only meetings I attended was when there was a pretty hot topic on it so uh, I'm guilty of that as well <laughs> it happens that's most of most of what happens. So you're not alone. It's a good idea. Okay. So you have a motion pending. I second that motion. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Council Member Orth. Aye. Council Member Cheney. Aye. Council Member Gornick. Aye. And I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, let's see, where were we at? Um, so brief city council reports and requests section six. Um, I don't know what order we're supposed to go in. So I'm just gonna go with who's on my screen. <laughs> council member Orth. Yes, I take the opportunity to uh, thank uh, Mrs. Taylor from, I do believe she's in the rec department. Uh, she did an excellent job giving me information and doing the whole uh, adopt a planner um, process. It was very informative. She did a great job. I adopted one or my family did. It looks like uh, most of the council members have done it. it, it it's gonna, I think it's gonna turn out really, really nice. There's still a lot left, everyone out there. Um, I think it's a great, uh, great thing for our city to be involved and we need to get our community involved. Um, I don't want to know if I'm supposed to do this, but I'd like to challenge um, our, our city unions to get involved in adopting some uh, planner boxes and, um, and let's get this, let's get this city looking green and, and bright this uh, springtime. Uh, I want to thank the police. Um, and the fire for what they do. All the city workers, uh, I saw them out there on the Thursday raining, pumping that water out. They, they were doing a great job. I mean, they, they worked hard. We got a lot of water. We needed it. Um, you guys are doing great. Um, uh, I, we, uh, I was allowed to be a part of the League of Cities uh, annual new council members uh, academy. Um, Mrs. Matthews and I were involved in that. It was very, very uh, educational um, and at times maybe a little overwhelming, but uh, I also want to thank uh, Nathan and them for getting us up with the IT people and getting it done. It, it worked out great. Uh, we had a great little uh, training and, and hopefully we'll be able to get the recording so we can uh, spread the word to all of us because it was very, very informal, uh, inform, inform, informative. Informational. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, we need to move forward. Happy, happy city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Orth. Council Member Cheney. Well, I just want to thank uh, uh, Chief Kendall and uh, Frank Rivera for the excellent uh, presentations that they gave tonight. And uh, I'd also like to uh, um, recognize uh, Officer Kurtz. He was uh, nominated as the LPD Officer of the Year. Um, and uh, that's well-deserved. Uh, I know Officer Kurtz and uh, I know how hard uh, he has worked how hard he's worked for the police department and the community. So um, well-deserved um, his nomination for officer of the year. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Sheila from uh, Parks and Recreation. Uh, I adopted two uh, planners um, and uh, she was very informative and uh, She's taken on the role of, um, you know, putting that out in the public and uh, having uh, community members uh, uh, adopt planners. And uh, like I said, I adopted two, and uh, she's made the uh, the process very enjoyable. So uh, I just commend her for her hard work, um, and. Uh, I had I've had the opportunity um, to attend one KCAO meeting um, as as part of my collateral duties as a council member, and um, um, kind of going through orientation, getting my feet wet. Um, so there's a lot of good things that they do, and uh, I'm very happy uh, to be a part of. Uh, KCO and uh, uh, look forward to uh, um, more meetings and uh, reporting back to the council on specific uh, items uh, that uh, that they're doing or that they have uh, adopted or decided uh, to take action on. And uh, that's it. 
Thank you, Council Member Cheney. Yeah. Council Member Gornick. Uh, I also wanted to uh, thank uh, Nathan uh, for putting together the uh, report today and also uh, Frank from Public Works and uh, uh, Chief Kendall for their reports. I thought they were very good, very thorough. Um, gave me a really good understanding of what uh, what the processes are in both of those areas with code enforcement. And uh, that was very helpful to me. And I think it'd be very, very helpful for the rest of us as we move forward with uh, solving some of those beautification issues for the city. Um, and I also attended as well as uh, Councilmember Matthews, the South Kings River uh, Water uh, can't remember all the, all the names of it, but uh, mm. we attended our first meeting and uh, very interesting, uh, the work that's being done on the south fourth of the Kings River and dealing with the water reclamation issues, uh, which are gonna be very important and significant for us as a city uh, in terms of uh, our underground water supply. So uh, uh, look forward to providing more input uh, from our next meetings. Um, other than that, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Council Member Gornick. Um, I'm gonna ditto most of what all the other council members said to kind of shorten mine a little bit. Um, some of those thanks and, and gratitudes were the same things I had written down. So to shorten, to make mine more brief, um, I did attend the KWRA um, board meeting. They're in the process of an efficiency study right now. So hope to get some more information on that in the near future uh, once that study's done. Um, also, just a heads up, there is a SB 1383 that's going to be coming down the pipeline. You'll be hearing more about that, um, I'm sure, coming from Nathan and, and staff. Um, some pretty interesting things going on there. Um, the San Joaquin Valley Air Board um, is scheduled for next week, so I haven't been to one of those yet. Um, and I just want to kind of uh, go along with what everybody was saying with the momentum with the um, uh, adopt a planner. It's going, it seems like it's going really fast and it looks like there's some challenges being thrown out there. I know uh, Council Member Cheney uh, mentioned a few times that he has two planters. So I don't know if somebody maybe wants to uh, adopt maybe three planters and one up him. Um, <laughs> maybe that's his challenge he was trying to, to implement there. But um, I'm all for friendly competition. Um, I also have two, by the way. So if anybody wants to adopt three, I might accept that as a challenge. Um, but it's 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 going really great. I've, I've talked to quite a few people. They're very excited about about helping out the community and and being on board with that. So I think it's 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 great for our city. So I, I look forward to that. And mine mine will be the best, by the way. So we can just clear that out now. <laughs> um, and I also kind of wanted to mention, um, I know uh, Dutch Bros is going to be having a Dutch Love Day on uh, February 13th and $1 from every drink is going to go to help feed members of our community. So make sure that you go support them on that day so that um, we can help out our, our community. So that's all I have. And with that, I guess we are adjourned at 8 12. <laughs> thank you thank you thank you good job pat patricia thank you good night, good night everybody good night, good night.